And just to get it correct, you're pretty much an advocate for human rights and the issue of basic fairness? Yep. That's okay to say? Pretty much sums it up. All right, well, I'm skipping. <laughs> yep, yeah, skip. All right. Welcome to the Late Night Scoop of Skip. I'm Joshua Skip Smith. My special guest this evening will be Chris Cluey, former NFL punter and advocate for human rights and the issue of basic fairness. He's a graduate of UCLA. He was drafted in 2005. Well, undrafted. He was drafted by the uh, Minnesota Vikings and went on to play for the Oakland Raiders to end his career. He retired on January 3rd, 2014. And at such a young age, uh, what factors you know led to the decision to retire? Well, I'm I'm not technically retired yet. It's it's more um, I got cut from my previous teams and then I uh, wrote a letter that probably ensures that other teams won't pick me up. But it's uh, I feel like I can still play. I feel like I still have the physical capabilities to play. Um, it's more the fact that since I spoke out on on same sex rights and, and human rights that I became known as a you know kind of distraction for you know that's the the buzzword that the NFL uses. And so teams look at it and say. It's easier to have a punter that doesn't speak up versus a punter who we know can do his job but will speak up because that's going to bring attention to the team. And NFL coaches are notoriously averse to any sort of attention going to their team. Absolutely. And what are some cultural changes that you notice that are taking place within the NFL at the you know current time besides this uh, same-sex marriage uh, debacle? Um, that that's pretty much the the main one is is the idea that um, as younger kids keep cycling through the NFL because it is a young man's league the um, the idea that people should be treated with fairness and equality because all that matters is can you play football it doesn't matter you know what your skin color is it doesn't matter what your religion is it doesn't matter what your sexuality is all that matters is can you suit up on Sunday and help this team win games and and so it's it's the same generational divide that you see in, in everyday society where older generations have a problem with someone's sexuality. It's, it's, it's an issue for them. And younger generations, it's very clear in the polling data, say, why is this an issue? Why do we care about this? There are other things we should be caring about. And, and so we're making changes, and we will continue to make changes. It's just going to take time to do so. Absolutely. You're right about that. Uh, you know, you publicly released a letter on Deadspin. And I just want to ask you, is Deadspin a reliable go-to online source for, you know, that professional athletes feel comfortable uh, going to and expressing their opinions? Um, or, or what made you go there? It, it really depends. It's, um, I wouldn't really call Deadspin a reliable source. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's more a... It's more a source I like them because, you know, 90% of the time you're going to get, like, cat pictures and, you know, this person was reading a book at an Angels game or something like that. But every so often they run a story where it's you know, very good in-depth reporting. And it's a very good, legitimate story that makes people sit up and take notice because they don't expect that. And, and it's a way to reach people that might otherwise not, might not read those stories. And, and um, I like, you know, I like Deadspin because I grew up on the internet and I kind of like the freewheeling nature of it. Um, you know, I, I, I write stories for them because, you know, I, originally it was someone called me out on Deadspin for, yeah. with the whole Nate Jackson thing. And I was like, well, I'm going to respond in kind, you know, so here's the forum to do it on. And after that, I kind of developed a relationship with them. But uh, I think any sports media is, is, it's important that they aren't beholden to the sport or the league that they cover. And that allows them to maintain their, you know, their professionalism. It allows them to maintain their neutrality as journalists, which I think is something that Deadspin does when compared to other sports networks, because other sports networks are very much invested in the leagues they cover. They, you know, they're very much part of, of who, who the, sorry, they're very much part of the people that they, that they follow. And I don't think Deadspin is, is that way. Deadspin is more like, here's something funny, or here's something interesting, or here's something that's stupid and you should be outraged about. And, you know, for me, that, that appeals to me, which is, which is why I write stuff for and you grew up on the internet, that's oh, a yeah. great point, you know, you, you know, you're probably in your early 30s, mm -hmm. I would assume, and, you know, society's becoming more and more digitized, mm -hmm. more than it ever has been before, and uh, are you a social media fan? How do you use social media? Do you use it to, you know, get your news, or do you use it to speak your, your mind? Uh, which ways do you use social media, and what are your thoughts about it? Well, I use it in um, a variety of ways. Um, you know, both both the, the ways that you mentioned is uh, you know what the, the primary ways I use it in that 
I, on Twitter, I follow um, a lot of different accounts that, that I get news from, that I, that I get up to date information about the world from, and, and I find the key there is to have a variety of sources, so that way you're not just locked into one worldview, you're not just locked into one way of thinking, but instead, you're getting many different ways of thinking, so that way you can balance them against each other and say, okay, is everyone reporting the same thing, or are certain sites biasing their news in certain ways, depending on goals that they want to achieve? You know, is this truly reliable news, or is this news with a slant? Is this news with an agenda? Because there, there's an important difference between the two of those. And being able to recognize source bias is a very important skill to have. Absolutely. And, and, and so, you know, I also use social media to interact with people. It's, it's a great way to talk to people. It's a great way to, you know, have conversations with people that you may never meet in your life. But now through the internet, through the power of, of interconnectivity on social media, you can have those conversations with those people. And, you know, a lot of people, when they look at sports figures, the, the, the past 15, 20 years, it was the only view you had of sports figures was what you saw on your nightly news program, yes. what you saw from the games, and then maybe if you had a chance to run into, into them at an autograph signing or something like that. You didn't really get to know the people behind the sports figure. Now with social media, you know the person behind the sports figure. There's so many kids growing up, you know, sharing who they are on social media, sharing, you know, what they find interesting, what they think is important, that I, th I think a lot of people are just now starting to figure out that, you know, athletes are human beings too. Athletes are just like everyone else. They, yeah, they may run really fast and they may hit a ball really far, but they still have the same wants and desires and needs as everyone else. And social media is a way to get that out there and to connect with people in a way that really we haven't been able to connect before. You're exactly right. You know, I, I really like uh, your view on, you know, treating people the same and, you know, just getting news and everything out there and making it uh, attainable. Mm -hmm. I feel that uh, this is the golden rule episode of the Late Night Scoop with Skip, you know, treat everybody equally. And, you know, you really did a great job doing that at your presentation here this, this evening at Bethany oh, College. Um, how's how's your wife and uh, both daughters doing now that you grad, uh, <laughs> have, have, <laughs> graduated have, have, from the NFL? <laughs> have been cut from the uh, from the Raiders most recently? Um, they're doing good. It's um, I'm I'm actually getting a chance to watch my daughters grow up, which is very nice. It's, yes. Uh, you know, playing football, um, especially when when your family lives in one city and you're in another, it makes it you know hard to to function because your your family's not there with you, and, and it can yeah. be very tough. And so I'm, I'm really relishing the fact that, you know, I, I get to be around for them running around in soccer, you know, doing soccer practice and, and yeah. going to school and stuff like that because, you know, I, I, I missed a lot of that over the last couple of years because of football. And so, you know, my, my wife is glad to have me home, and then some days she'll be like, you need to get out of the house because you're driving me crazy. <laughs> and then, then other days she'll be like, what, you're leaving for another speaking presentation? No, don't really? go. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same as any other, you know, any other couple where, you know, you, you, you definitely want to be around each other, but you also drive each other crazy because that's that's what people do <laughs> well, I'm glad to get that insight you know it's, yeah. it's good to know about you know personal lives as well mm -hmm. uh, you know just briefly did you ever play fantasy football while you were a NFL football player uh, no I actually never got into fantasy football it's um I'm, I'm more of a uh, fantasy Dungeons and Dragons wizards and, and role-playing okay fantasy you, player <laughs> how about uh, like just out of curiosity do you know of players that might participate in fantasy football even mm -hmm. though they play the sport does that yeah. happen yeah there, yeah there's a tons of tons of players that play fantasy football it was it was funny actually the um Blair Walsh the the kicker for the Vikings he's a big fantasy football player and the um the first year he was with us he uh he was like yeah you know I have AP on my team but I'm not sure whether to start him or not because you know, yeah. this was right after AP was coming af off his knee injury I'm like you better start AP because you know he's gonna run wild over yeah. people he's like oh well I don't know if he... and then the very first game I think AP ran for like 150 yards and two touchdowns <laughs> and wow. he's like I'm starting him every game after this so it's it's funny I think it um it gives guys another way to look at the game that they play and it also allows them to connect with fans too in, in that you know they can commiserate with fans over like a bad fantasy performance or, or a good fantasy performance and be like you know what I'm I'm doing the same things you are I just happen to also be out on the field at times doing it too yeah. <laughs> so it's uh yeah it's it's it I can see the appeal in it do you think it in, uh, increases interaction between fans and players uh you know increases the knowledge that they mm -hmm. have about the game you know more so than they would 
if they didn't play fantasy football? Um, I think it does to a point, but I think it increases that interaction in a more offensively oriented capacity as opposed to learning all the rules for the game because most fantasy football tends to be about, you know, points scored. Did, you, did your quarterback reach so many yards? Did he get so many touchdowns? You know, did your running back rush for a certain amount? Did your receivers get so many yards? And then you have the defense as a whole. You know, did your defense hold them to, to a shutout or, you know, seven points or whatever? And so I think it's a way for fans to get interested in the game in a way which ordinarily they might not might, might not be interested in, but at the same time it's not giving them that full experience of the game where a player, you know, say a nose tackle who clogs up the middle and keeps the other team's running back from rushing for, you know, more than 50 or 60 yards because yeah. he's constantly having to try to bounce it outside, that doesn't show up in any fantasy stats. <laughs> that, you know, you have no idea what that guy contributed, whereas if you watch the game and, and you're looking for those intricacies, then you know that, okay, yeah, that guy's not going to show up on any stat line, but he had a monster game, and he really helped his team win that game. So I think fantasy is a good entry level, but it's not the end-all, be-all. There is definitely still more there for fans who want to pursue it. Absolutely. I mean, I really appreciate your insight on fantasy football. I just mm -hmm. thought that'd be like an interesting topic to touch base on. Uh, you just released a book. You just mm -hmm. published a book, uh, Beautifully Unique Sparkle Ponies. Mm -hmm. It was released on June 25th, <laughs> 2013. This book is a collection of essays on various topics. Can you just uh, elaborate a little bit on what type of topics or essays you, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's integrated in the in the book, your uh, first book? Pretty much all over the place. Um, a, a lot of them have to do with the stuff I talked about tonight, the idea of rational empathy, treating other people the way you'd like to be treated. Because, um, like, I, like I said in the presentation, that I think we as a species need to figure out how to do that better or else we're going to continue collapsing over and over again. You, you look at the historical record and every single civilization has failed over the test of time. So if we don't want to keep up ending up in the same place, we have to learn how to do things differently. Otherwise, we will keep up ending up in the same place because we always do. I mean, there, <laughs> there, there is no other way. And, and so there, there's a lot of that in there. There's a lot of um, things that I think are, are interesting or, or worth talking about. Uh, you know, the, the idea I, I briefly referenced in there, the idea that as human beings, we're, we're living on the frozen crust of an explosion, hurtling through space at over 20,000 miles an hour, and we think that's normal. You know, we, we take so many things for normal in our everyday life that when you take a step back and look at them, you're like, that is amazing. Like, that yeah. is not even close to normal. But because we don't, we never take that step back, we just consider it normal. We, we consider the universe to be our house and the five miles that surround it. We think that's the entirety of the world. But it's not. It's so much more. There's so many weird and interesting things out there that... If you never go out and go looking, then you're never going to find them. They're, they're not going to come to you. You have to go search for them. And, and so just things like that. There's also um, some humorous topics, um, yeah. making uh, <laughs> thing, thing, things that annoy me, like people in airplanes who lean their seats back into my knees. When <laughs> or on <laughs> buses. Yeah, or on buses. When, when you're already crammed into this tiny yeah. space and like, yeah, great. You'll get your two inches where it's not even helping you lean back at all. It's just crushing my kneecaps. Yeah. So just you know, a wide variety of topics, but hopefully things that – that make people think and make people talk and, and, and make people understand that the world is an interesting place and you know human beings are interesting creatures and, and we all bring different things to, to our lives and people should be celebrated for those things. They, they shouldn't be cast aside, they shouldn't be discriminated against because they don't happen to be exactly the same as someone else. Yes, you're a very interesting person yourself. Well, you know, you. I really do feel that way do you, and, and I feel I don't like... always drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a second book uh, in mind, or would you ever uh, think of possibly publishing another book? Yeah, Did yeah. you like writing? Oh, yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed it, and, and I plan on writing more. I'm working on my football memoirs right now, and mm -hmm. then um, some, uh, some science fiction books with, uh, with a friend of mine, and then I've got ideas for, for a couple of other books that I want to do. So it's, I definitely, yeah, I definitely have things I want to write about, and um, they, they will hopefully be published at some point in the future. Well, if you can remember, what was the last book you read, and how did it affect you? Uh, last book I read, um, it's actually been a little while because I've been busy with traveling. I want to say probably Brandon Sanderson's uh, new book. He's a fantasy science fiction author, uh, Words of Radiance. It's um, it's the second book in his series. Really long book. It's really good. Uh, but it's it, it, that was more for entertainment. Uh, it was um, I, I like reading science fiction and fantasy. That's kind of my preferred genre. And uh, the thing I really like about science fiction and fantasy is that you can read it for entertainment, but if you look deeper, then a lot of times what authors are writing about in science fiction and fantasy are things that have already happened in human history. <laughs> so, you know, for, for example, a lot of people really like Game of Thrones, you know, not just the books, but also the TV show. It's, it's very popular. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Game of Thrones is essentially George R. R. Martin retelling the War of the 
Roses, which really? is in European history. Yeah, it's this, this conflict between a whole bunch of different, you know, royal actors and states all vying for central power over Europe. And, you know, the, the similarities are very, very close. Only George R. R. Martin has, you know, zombies and dragons and, and magic and stuff like that. But the political intrigue is exactly the same. So if you want to look deeper, if you want to examine underneath the surface, then there's a lot you can learn from something that is supposedly just entertainment. Well, that's a very interesting uh, point you bring up there. And, you know, you're a very inspiring person yourself just by the way you, you know, talk oh, and <laughs> the way you talk about specific topics. Um, and for you to be so inspiring, I guess, to, to the audience here this evening, who inspires you? Who's your role model that's, you know, got you to feel the way you do and, and speak up and out about the things that you mm -hmm. speak up and out about? Um. I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's probably just all the people around me in the world who who do the right thing. You know, all the people who have come before who have risked, you know, things that were important to them to to say the right thing and to speak up for other people. Because it's it's I think one of the most important things we can do as human beings is is to be aware of the other people around us and understand that without the other people that form our society, that society doesn't exist. We all need each other in order to survive. And and so, you know, without the people who constantly say that, without the people who constantly fight for for civil rights, for human rights, for people to have the ability to live free and not be oppressed by someone else, well, if we don't have those people, then we don't have a human society. We don't we don't have, you know, a, a found a stable foundation in which to live. And and so I, I think it's just, you know, reading history as a whole, reading political science, you know, reading science fiction and fantasy, which has themes of, of building a better future and, and working together and, and kind of just examining the world and, and understanding that as long as we keep fighting each other, well, we're always going to keep ending up in the same place. We're, we're just going to keep collapsing. So we have to figure out how not to do that. Uh, you, you bring up another good point. Do you think that the NFL is going to keep collapsing the idea or the uh – the um, the idea of you know Michael Sam coming into the NFL being the first gay uh, athlete mm -hmm. you know to play professional sports do you think that they're going to keep collapsing that idea or is it going to be allowed you know are they going to mm -hmm. actually allow him into the league and what do you think mm -hmm. his future is going to hold um I'm hoping that that teams will give him a fair chance because he's a good football player and they'll understand that he's a good football player who happens to be gay and that shouldn't make a difference as as to how you're you're evaluated. And um, I think going forward that it will become less and less of a problem because society is moving in that direction as a whole. And this is very much a generational issue. It's, it's very much a long-term issue, just like all civil rights are. It's, you know, they, they take time. They, they, they take a, a long time, to be frank, with, with most of them. I mean, we still have problems with segregation and misogyny in the United States, and those were conflicts we had 100, 150 years ago. So it's, it's not something that just gets fixed overnight. But we are making steps in the right direction. We just need to continue making those steps and, and recognizing the fact that this is something important that we need to work at as a society. And this is something important that we need to work at as a society. I want to especially thank my special guest here, Chris Cluey, uh, for taking time to chat and update everyone, you know, with what you've been up to nowadays mm -hmm. and what you're up to in the future. Mm -hmm. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, that's all for now, and thanks for tuning in to the Late Night Scoop with Skip. I'm Joshua Skip Smith, and now you got the scoop from Chris Cluey and myself. You're in the loop. See you next time, folks.